This is the second part of our tutorial about on-chip spiral inductors. The first part covered the geometry import and port assignment process. In this part, we will cover how to create a solution setup and analyze the spiral inductor. We'll go to the project tree, right-click on the analysis entry, and choose Add an HFSS solution setup. Spiral inductor simulations demand a lot of accuracy, so we're going to crank up the accuracy settings here. In the General tab, set the solution frequency to 10 GHz. Then set the maximum number of adaptive meshing passes to 20, and drop the convergence criterion to 1%. Then in the Advanced tab, one trick is to make sure that the Form Polygon Union Before Meshing option is checked. This option will speed up the initial mesh significantly. In the Solver tab, we make sure in the Modeling Options section that all the values are set to 0 millimeters. This will ensure that all of the layers are modeled in full 3D without any simplifying assumptions. And in the Solution Options, we'll choose Mixed Order Basis Functions and we'll enable the Iterative Solver. These two options will speed up the solution process without any compromise in the accuracy. We always recommend them for on-chip simulations. After you click OK, the Frequency Sweep tab will appear. Here we are going to adjust it so that the sweep will go all the way from 0 up to 20 GHz. There's also an option to use Q3D's solver for the DC point calculation, but we're not going to use that in this exercise. Before running the analysis, let's define output variables to represent the key performance metrics for spiral inductors. This can be done by right-clicking in the project tree on Results, Output Variables. We'll define two output variables. The first is L for inductance. We use the Y11 entry here. That's the admittance that we see looking into port 1 with port 2 shorted. We take the reciprocal to get the impedance. Then we take the imaginary part of that and divide by 2 pi times the frequency to get inductance. We're using a one-port formula since we only care about single-ended operation here. The second output variable is Q for quality factor. This is the ratio of the imaginary to the real part of the impedance. Now let's go back to the solution setup. We can click on the Advanced button on the General tab. and We can now set the output variables that we just defined as additional convergence criteria for the simulation. We'll use 5% for inductance and 10% for quality factor. Normally, HFSS uses the change in S parameters to guide the convergence process. By checking these options, we can be sure that the results will also be accurate to within the given limits for L and Q. By default, HFSS will model metal objects using something called an impedance boundary condition. Only the metal's outer surface is modeled, not its interior. This is an approximation that works very well at high frequencies where skin effect is small compared to the conductor thickness. But for an on-chip device, that may not be true. So we select the metal, go into the EM Design Properties menu, Add Modeling, and then activate the Solve Inside option. Now HFSS will model the conductor interior accurately. Another factor to consider for accuracy is how much of the region surrounding the spiral will be modeled. You can control this by going to the 3D viewer and selecting the HFSS Extents item from the EM Design menu, as shown here. In the HFSS Model Extents tab, you can control the dielectric horizontal padding, which is how far out the passive layer beneath the inductor extends, and the airbox vertical and horizontal padding, which controls how far out the air or vacuum region should go in all directions. You can enter the exact dimensions of the extents by specifying a unit of length. If you don't specify a unit, then the entry is taken to represent a relative value, where 1 is equal to 100% padding. For accuracy, we'll boost all of the extent values here. Before running the simulations, you can validate the design by clicking on the check mark here. This will tell you if you missed any setup or major boundary conditions. That's it for part two. In part three of the tutorial, we'll show how to launch the simulation and view the results.